welcome to the D3 D4 Football Podcast with me, your host, James Richards. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a D3 D4 Football Podcast Extra. A little bit of bonus content for you this week. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by a man who is a record breaker. He's part of uh, a club history that I'm sure everyone who supports that team will know all too well about. And a man I respect hugely, also helped by the fact that his surname is also one of my favourite foods. So, uh, brilliant stuff. It is, of course, Oldham Athletics former manager and striker Frankie Bunn. Welcome to D3D4 Football, Frankie. Hi, evening. You OK? Yes, I'm, I'm very good, thank you. I'm good. Delighted you agreed to join us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, really looking forward to having a chat with you because uh, you were a player um, at a team in Oldham that were everyone's favourite sort of second side in with my childhood growing up. Um, wonderful achievements for a club of that size were, uh, were you know, remarkable and done in a time when I think football was, was quite different and smaller clubs perhaps could have these big aspirations. Uh, so looking forward to having a chat with you about that. Obviously, as well, your more recent um, escapades in management, which I'm sure there's a lot of Oldham fans who would like to have uh, like to have a listen to what you've got to say about that. So, yeah, but let's start at the beginning. I always ask this question to every guest we have on the podcast. Um, how did you first get into football as a kid? Because you, you were born and, and grew up in Birmingham, is that correct? Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, obviously, uh, I think it was uh, my dad that used to take me to watch... Um, Sunday League football, um, and uh, I was, you know, I was in, probably in a push chair at the time, and and then ended up watching a lot of amateur football. Uh, my dad was a big Birmingham City supporter, um, so I ended up uh, going down to St Andrews, you know, to watch people like uh, Trevor Francis, Dan Arlen, Roger Ryan, Gordon Taylor, Bob Atten, you know, Kenny Burns, um, and and stood on the terraces until I was, uh, you know, fourteen, fifteen. But obviously playing as well from, from an early age, played for the local Sunday league teams, um, school teams, uh, district, county, uh, you know, and finally breaking through um, at Luton Town. So how did that, uh, how did that move to Luton come about? Because obviously you must have caught the eye of uh, some scouts, was it, when you're, when you're playing um, sort of low league football, Sunday league football? Yeah, that's right. You know, um, th- there was two clubs that I could have gone to, uh, West Bromwich Albion. Um, who offered me apprenticeship forms and Luton Town. Um, I mean, at, at, at the time, uh, West Brom had the likes of uh, Cyril Regis, uh, Tony Brown, Laurie Cunningham. You wow. know, they had, a, they had a fabulous, you know, front line. And no disrespect to Luton. Um, and obviously, West Brom were, were then in the first division, which is now the Premier League. Um, Luton Town were in the second division, which is now the Championship. Uh, I, I plumped to go to, to Luton. What, what was the sort of factors behind your decision to join the Hatters? Well, you know, basically that I, I wanted to break through as quickly as possible. I, I felt I had more of a chance certainly doing that at Luton Town. Um, uh, the manager, uh, um, David Pleat was, uh, a coach, uh, when he first seen me and ended up became, uh, becoming the manager. Um, so I signed apprenticeship forms. Uh, it's funny because I left school at Easter, I think, on the on the Tuesday or Wednesday, and I was playing in a tournament in Holland on by the weekend, um, you know, over Easter. Uh, and then the season came to that season came to an end. And then I signed uh, apprenticeship forms, and I made my debut a year after signing. You know, I did a year apprenticeship and and ended up playing, making my debut at seventeen. Yeah, so I can imagine. I mean, that that West Brom side probably was that under Ron Atkinson at the time when they they did some. I mean, I think they beat Manchester United. Was it six two or seven two or something in the in a in a Premier League game or first division game? So they mm. they would have been a, a pretty tough uh, tough cookie to crack. But you got into the Luton team quite quickly, and then you know you were, had a pretty good goal scoring record for them, didn't you? Yeah, I, I mean, I started. Uh as a centre forward and then uh, David uh, decided to play me left side midfield um, and I had two two wonderful years you know playing in, in the first division which is now the Premier League uh, visiting Old Trafford Anfield White Hart Lane Ivory um, and we we had some really good players you know there was the famous incident of 
uh, beating Man City to stay up. Um, but gaining promotion was was massive, and uh, we managed to stay in around the first division for for quite a while. You know, uh, again playing semi-finals in the in the FA Cup. Um, you know, whilst I was there. So it was a, a terrific group of players. And obviously David was quite innovative at the time with his coaching methods. And, uh, you know, we, we really had a, an enjoyable time there. I can, I can imagine. I can imagine. Who, who was the best player you think you came up against during that sort of time in the first division? Oh, uh, wow. Um, I mean, the people like uh, Mark Lawrence and... Uh, you know, Sooners would have been playing in that Liverpool team that 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 were just uh, you know probably unstoppable at the time. They were a terrific team. Um, but yeah, the you know the likes of Glenn Oddle, um you know uh, there was there was some very good uh, British players around at the time. It was a predominantly British first division, wasn't it? Because of course the the influx of of, sort of foreign players that we see now. Um, had not even really started. It was quite unusual to have a foreigner in in a first division squad, which seems mad when you think about it at the moment. Yeah, I mean, we had one in Radi Antic who, who scored the goal at uh, um, Main Road uh, that kept us up. But yeah, you know, I agree with you. The uh, the foreign influence, you know, wasn't around then. So obviously, the the, the British kids got a chance. Um, squads were small. Uh, I remember starting my apprenticeship. There was five. Five of us taken on, who uh, joined six second year apprenticeships. So you know that was your youth team. Um, you, you know, so times have changed. Football's evolved. Um, you know, a lot of it for the better. Um, but but surely, you know, sure for uh, for youngsters, you, I, I think we had certainly more of a chance of breaking through. But you, again, you had to be good enough and. Uh, you know, if you weren't, you, you were discarded quite early. Yeah, I think football's always had that sort of ruthless streak to it. But, you know, academies now, of course, we, we hear about Chelsea and obviously Chelsea doing very well with the players that they're now bringing into the first team, albeit kind of forced because of this transfer embargo. But, you know, Manchester City, for example, have uh, maybe 140 kids, 100 kids maybe in their in their system that most of which won't play. Do you think that's that's healthy for youngsters or... or is it better in the era where you know you literally were a small group of players and, and you'd at least get a chance? Yeah, I mean myself personally, I, I don't think it's right. You know, um, I think you know, the big Premier League clubs cast you know their nets far and wide um, and and take a chance and spend a lot of money on on players that probably won't get anywhere near their first team uh, rather than being more selective. You know, it's uh, I think Chelsea have have done it a different way in the, in the respect that they have um, like a stable if you like of, of thoroughbreds uh, that are coming to the forefront now um, and they used a, a business model uh, they had you know uh, 30 40 kids out on loan at one time um, so you can imagine the cost of you know um, incorporating that incorporating that into your budget that they're going out on loan, they're gaining experience and, you know, they've come back and, again, if they, if they weren't good enough for Chelsea, they were picking up 20 odd million, like Savaka, who went to Bournemouth and, and getting their money back. But now, with the, uh, the ban on Chelsea's, uh, you know, transfer, uh, policy, the kids have had a chance and they've, they've shown, you know, uh, what they can do up until now. I think they've acquitted themselves quite well and, uh, pretty much a good example of what happens when you when you play your own kids and of course not loaning out so many players in some respects is good for lower league clubs in that they then are forced to play their own young players and give them a chance so it kind of cascades down slightly but getting back to your sort of career your time at Luton came to an end was it in 1985 when you joined Hull how did that move come about well it was, uh, it was funny because I went to uh, um, a sort of uh, a uh, little reunion uh, over the weekend. Unfortunately, one of the apprentices uh, I was with at Luton has uh, got terminal cancer, and uh, uh, you know I met up with uh, a few of the lads, and you know it was it was a real sad occasion, but uh, an occasion where he was, he, you know, the, the man concerned was quite lifted. Um, but going back to your question. Uh, I just had two years playing in the first division. I went in for a pay rise. I think it was David Moss 
at the time gave me a little bit of advice. So I, I went in to see David and, uh, um, I came out not signing. So, uh, I was in digs at the time and, uh, he says, why do you want a pay rise? So I said, well, I want to get my own house. You know, I want to get on the, the property ladder. And he says, well, I've put you in the best digs with the best landlady. Why, why do you want a house? Yeah. So, you know, I was still young at the time. I think I was like 21, um, you know, 22. Um, but, uh, I, I couldn't dissuade him, you know, and, uh, unfortunately I, I left the club and that was a case as I was talking with some of the lads over the weekend of, of the way they departed the, the football club as well. So, um, it was, it was quite funny looking back, but obviously not at the time. Uh, Brian Orton was a manager at uh, Hull City who I played with at Luton. Oh, what um, a, what a manager. He was, um, as an Oxford fan, he was the first manager in charge when I first started supporting them, actually. Right. Okay. Well, I played with Brian for, you know, for two or three years. Um, obviously Brian, uh, was at an age where he was just coming towards the end of his career and, uh, he, uh, took up the reins at Hull City, got them promoted. Uh, they ended up in, uh, in, in what is now the championship and I, I went to meet him and then I signed for, for Hull City. Did you enjoy your time there? Cause again, you, you had, I think, is it 23 goals in 95 league games for them? Yeah. Well, uh, Brian put me back up front. Um, and I played with a, a big fella called Billy Whitehurst, who was terrific to play with, um, an absolute beast. Uh, and we we were very good together. You, you know, I think the pair of us, had certainly in my first season there, the pair of us between us had scored thirty odd goals uh, at Christmas time. So uh, we were quite prolific, and uh, we, we enjoyed each other's company. Always helps having a, a good rapport with it with your teammates. Where did you where did you finish with Hull in terms of in the league table? Do you remember? Uh, I think we were just outside the playoffs uh, in, in my first year. Uh, I think it was sixth or seventh. Um, uh, so you know, it, again, there was, there was there was some really good players there, and Brian assembled you know a very good football team. Nineteen eighty seven, you moved again. This time joining um, a proper club legend in Joe Royal at Oldham Athletic. Um, you went to play on a, a pitch that never suffered because of the weather, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> no, it wasn't great for our joints, I don't think. But uh, in, in, yeah, yeah, obviously we played on the uh, the artificial pitch, um, which you know I asked I asked Joe, you know, uh, you know what what do you think? He went, you'll have no problem on it because you've got good touch, you keep hold of the ball. And you look after the ball, um, so you won't have a problem on it. So I, I took him on his word and, uh, had a really, really enjoyable time, uh, with, with, uh, the, the people, the staff, uh, around the football club, uh, the players, obviously, and, and the coaching staff. Um, it was an unbelievable time. Um, but I remember sort of playing at home. Uh, my first game, I think we had about just over three and a half thousand there. And by the time I finished, which was only two, two and a half, three years later, the crowds were up to 17,000. It was uh, a remarkable turnaround of, of fortunes. And I think Joe certainly called one of the seasons the pinch me season, um, which put Oldham on the map. Oh, unbelievable. I mean, um, I even remember at, sort of at the time, you know, this small team, uh, so I suppose in the shadow slightly of the bigger clubs in the in the region, just emerging. Uh, that 90, uh, 1989-90 cup run, um, yeah. absolutely yeah. fantastic stuff. Stuff yeah. that dreams are made of. I mean, what was Joe Raw like as a, as a manager? Uh, outstanding. His his man, man management was was terrific. Not so much uh, you know being a, a coach. He had an excellent coach alongside him uh, called Willie Donerkey. Who, who sort of was his legs. Um, you know, Joe was always on the training field, but sort of Willie really took, took the majority of the sessions. Uh, but Joe knew how to handle players and personalities. And, uh, you know, when, when I look back, we, we were all, um, uh, sort of rejects, you know, we were discarded players from, from various clubs. Um, he bought youngsters for, you know, 10, 15,000 that weren't wanted at Man City, Everton, Leeds. And uh, he assembled, uh, you know, a group of players that 
majority of them went on to, to bigger and better things. In, uh, I say that with no disrespect to Oldham, but you know they went on to play for Everton's uh, you know, non-Man United, you know, re- really big clubs, and they were good players. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you don't you don't achieve what you guys did without having good players. I mean, the, the way that you describe the way he recruited is similar, actually, in, in some respects to how Jim Smith did it at Oxford United. Um, you know, half a decade earlier in the 80s, because yeah. something that has changed in football is the ability for smaller clubs to sign players who are rejected from the top level of football. Yeah. Um, because, of course, the money is, you know, a, a sort of reserve player in the Premier League now will probably be earning 20 to 25,000 a week, which, you know, the wage disparity was nowhere near that big uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. You could, you could actually build a really good team full of, like you say, players who didn't quite make it at a, at a bigger club. Yeah, and obviously the squads weren't as big, you know, no one carried massive squads at the time. Um, and it, it was a good hunting ground, uh, you know, uh, Joe had a, um, a chief scout, uh, Jim Cassells, who, who went on to um, manage Man City's academy, who, who had a, an eye for a player, you know, and I'm, I'm talking about Mike Milligan, you know, Dennis Irwin, Tommy Wright. Dennis you know. Irwin, what a player. I mean, yeah, so, great players. Yeah, I mean... The list goes on. Paul Warrest, who was another one from from Man City, uh, that Joe hardly played, you know, uh, any money for, and ended up going to Blackburn and, you know, and, and, and bigger things. So Earl Barrett was another one who went on. I was to just about to say one of my yeah. favourite players, and I thought he was. He's probably not given the credit he he should be because um, he was in an era where there were so many good defensive players in in the top flight. But Earl Barrett was a class defender, wasn't he? Yeah, I'm not, he, he was terrific, and he was a defender. You, you know, he, the, there was no ifs and buts about it. He was purely a defender. Uh, perhaps wasn't great in possession, and you won't mind me saying that. But there's no one could outjump him. There was no one could outrun him, and there was no one that could outmuscle him. And at times, I think when we were playing, uh, Joe would just go man for man at the back and pe- let people flood forward. Um, it was quite an exhilarating. Uh, period of you know of football uh, which all the players thoroughly enjoyed I can absolutely imagine it in your first season you finished 10th then 16th the year after in 89-90 you finished 8th and you know unbelievable uh, run in the in the League Cup during that era and in October 1989 in a certain League Cup tie which I don't know if you ever get tired of hearing about it I, <laughs> I would imagine not but you scored six times in a 7 0 win over Scarborough. I mean, what was that? Must have been mad for you. Yeah, it was uh, an incredible evening. And, uh, you know, I, I, I often say to people, it's my anniversary today. Yeah. And, and they say, uh, well, how many years have you been married? I went, no, 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 no. You know, it's. it's 30, the important it was, one. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's 30 years. You know, it's 25th of October. It's been 30 years. And, you know, no one's broken the record yet. And, uh, you know, we get a good bit. I can still describe the goals, um, but yeah, it was. Um, they weren't scuff finishes, were they, Frankie? Uh, one, the first one was. Uh, the the rest were really good goals, you know, some really good team play, you know, a little bit of individual work as well. But uh, what people, you know, some pessimists say, well, it was only Scarborough, and you were on the plastic. Scarborough had just beaten Chelsea in the previous round they played to us, and yeah. uh, you know we were quite. I, I wouldn't say worried but we were respectful of, of them and uh, I mean luckily for us uh, and, and for myself I think I, I only had six or seven chances and I took all of them um, and I laid the other one on for Andy Ritchie so I had a great night and uh, obviously to progress to the, to the next round at the time was, was fantastic and then to go all the way to the final was, was unbelievable and, and we were also I think in the uh, FA Cup semi-final that year as well so uh, we were in, always in and around the playoffs um, and I think the, the season sort of just caught up with us uh, being a small squad as I mentioned uh, earlier um, you know we sort of ran out of steam towards the end but uh, the the atmosphere the um, the support around the town uh, I mean it, it just put Oldham on the map you know we, we came from nowhere and like I said earlier we were a bunch of misfits put together and, and we achieved, you know, really good things. That's the best kind, though. Best kind of teams, a bunch of misfits put together, go on. And... <laughs> it's, it's brilliant stuff, you know. 
You, yeah. It's all this building stuff from your academy and signing yeah. you know, eighty million pound straight. It's all it's overrated. Um, <laughs> uh, hey, but, I, I, I think Joe, is, you know, he looks back fondly of, uh, of those days as well. You know, we have, we have fond memories. Uh, you know, we're still in touch um, as a majority of the players are. We, we were just a unique bunch of players that put together, and we we we. we thoroughly enjoyed each other's company on and off the field um, and uh, the rewards were there for you know for everybody to see yeah great times great times and that cup run by the way you beat Leeds uh, 4-2 on Agra over two legs you beat Scarborough 7-0 you beat Arsenal 3-1 <coughs> uh, then you got to the fifth round beating Southampton 4-2 I think it was in or no 2-0 in the replay after a 2 all draw and yeah. then you beat West Ham 6-0 and Lost obviously the, the second yeah. three now, but one six for an aggregate to get through yeah. to to the final. I actually watched the final um, back recently. I remember watching it at the time with with my dad, thinking, "Who who's this old athletic team?" Because I mean, you know, they were uh, sort of, you were you were in the second division, so you wouldn't have been getting particularly the national coverage. But what was that Wembley trip like for you? Oh, that is, it was every player's dream to play at Wembley, and. Uh... Obviously, to to get there and play there was, you know, uh, one of the pinnacles of uh, anyone's career. Um, I was amazed at how many people from Oldham turned up. I I, I didn't realise how many people lived in Oldham, and you, you know, there was forty odd thousand Oldham supporters there. Where where did they all come from? Um, so I could imagine half the town being empty whilst we were down south. Um, the, just the, the flood of blue and white around the approach to Wembley. Um, and, and the noise within the within the stadium, and, and actually walking, you know, on, through the tunnel onto the pitch was just, just a, an exhilarating feeling. I can imagine. Uh, it was a close game. I mean, you lost one 0 Nigel Jemson scoring the only goal, but it could have been very, very different on another day. Do you still look back though, and you must be just still immensely proud of, of having competed in a, in a final, given that you were at the time a second division club? Yeah, I think we all were, but I think there was a bit of disappointment certainly after the game because, you know, like you've just mentioned, you know, we thought we had a chance of winning it. Um, we had great belief in ourselves, um, and you know, we we got that far and actually thought we could win it. You, you know, so we we went there with plenty of confidence. The unfortunate thing for me that was probably my third last game for Oldham Athletic. You know, I. I, uh, I think I played two or three games after that final. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have played in the final. Um, I was carrying a knee injury. Um, uh, we came back uh, uh, on the same evening because we, I think we played Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday after that final, and, and the final was held quite late uh, uh, during those times. And um, I, I had surgery again in the summer, and I never played that year after uh, trying to recover from surgery and uh, you know ultimately never played for Oldham again at the, you know I, sort of my last game I was 26 years of age it still hurts it still hurts you know to this day um, I know I hear retired players saying I don't miss the game but I, I sort of miss quite a large chunk of, of, of playing football and uh, you know it's uh, it's still you know, plays at the back of my mind. What what could I have achieved, um, along with all those good players that went on to better things? Yeah, very difficult. I mean, you know, to retire at 26. Obviously, if you're playing in the modern era, it may have been easier because of the the knee operations that they're able to do now. Um, oh, yeah. I, th- I think uh, you, you know that that side of the game has improved immensely you, you know you're talking about dietitians physiotherapy surgery yeah, I mean that as, as well as the game evolving all the you know off the field stuff has evolved as well for the better um, training grounds pitches um, you know so uh, you know players are, are, are really treated well yeah they certainly think they are how did you cope though and how did you make the decision of what to do next with your career after being forced to retire from the game you love so young yeah yeah, well, I was, I, I was uh, Joe called me in and uh, into the office. I went to see him. He, he said, I don't think we can go any further because it, it got to the stage where I was just training. Uh, sorry, just trying to play. I couldn't train. Um, and uh, 
you know, I, I felt that I needed to train. So if I played a game, my knee would just blow up and it would take over, a, you know, a week to recover, really. Um, so I ended up in tears. It was, it was the only thing I knew since leaving school. Um, and then I had to come home and, and sort of decide what I wanted to do. Um, obviously living up in, in Oldham, uh, being a Birmingham boy, do I go back home? Uh, do I stay uh, and, and, and try and forge a, uh, another career uh, in, in the Manchester area? And I ended up uh, going to working for the PFA uh, on, a, on a community scheme. I was a community uh, officer at uh, Wooden Athletic where we went out to promote football to the schools, um, you know, and put various functions on for for disabled people, for pensioners. It was it was a community based project and. Uh, during those three or four years I did that, I gained all my uh, coaching qualifications up to A license and uh, uh, ended up um, uh, coaching at uh, non-league level. Um, and uh, eventually Jim Casello, who I mentioned earlier, asked me to go to Man City and uh, coach uh, an under-16s team, uh, which I did. And uh, at that time, I, I think I had three jobs. I was a community officer. I was working in non-league, and I, on a Sunday, I, I took Man City's under 16s. And uh, I think after a year of being with the 16s, uh, Jim sort of invited me to go into Man City full time. And uh, obviously, I, I learned uh, my my profession, um, and ended up taking the. Uh, Obviously started with the, with the under 17s and ended up taking, uh, the reserve team and working alongside Stuart Pierce and, um, Steve Wigley, who, who were the manager and assistant manager of the first team. So it, it was quite, you know, uh, encouraging for me that I'd, from where I'd come from, um, but you, you still miss playing. Yeah, I can imagine that you always miss playing it. it- yeah. Everyone I've spoken to who's now a manager always tells me that they miss playing. Although being a coach is probably the next best thing because it keeps you involved in the game and keeps you in an around sort of a familiar environment. Is that something you feel is the next best thing? Yeah, I, I would endorse that. I, I, and, and again, you know, I because I finished early, I, I missed it desperately. But um, it is certainly the next best thing because you, you're on the grass, uh, you're, you're in a group environment. Um, and uh, whilst I was working in development football, it was it was a privilege to watch uh, the kids break through into the you know the various first teams. And uh, on the development side, I, I took great pleasure in, in being part of, of you know the young players' development. Any particular gems that you you want to tell us that you watch come through? Oh well, uh, I think whilst you know the time we were at Man City. Um, you're talking people like Danny Sturridge, Sean Wright Phillips, Nader Manua, uh, Michael Johnson, Stephen Ireland, Glenn Whelan, uh, Paddy McCarthy. Uh, the, the list was endless. I think we sold uh, sort of around £55 million pounds worth of talent uh, within eight years that we worked at Man City. And, uh, and, and then recently, you know, whilst I was at Huddersfield, we've, you know, Huddersfield have just sold Philip Billing for £15 million to and Bournemouth, um, who, who was perhaps the, 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 one of the last ones that, that, that I worked with. Incredible stuff. How, how did you become involved in Huddersfield? Well, I mean, after whilst I was at Man City, I, Ian Dowie asked me to go down to Coventry as first team coach, uh, which I did for the three years. Um, uh, then I went to uh, Newcastle, worked for a while on their academy, ended up going to, to Rochdale as an assistant manager. Uh, and then from there went to, to Huddersfield where I spent five years uh, working on their academy and uh, you know uh, progressing their their academy which uh, it was just at the, at the process of the EPPP. Um, so uh, you know I've seen the the academy system uh, grow into the, the EPPP and, and and so on. So yeah, we we had some good times at Huddersfield uh, uh, as well. I can imagine. And then, of course, in 2018, Oldham had just got relegated. Um, they had new owners and they were looking for a manager. And your name was quite quickly, if I remember rightly, being linked with the job. How did that come about? How did the, the 
well, firstly, how did you hear about it? Did you apply for it? And how did the offer come about? Yeah, uh, there was um, uh, a man called Alan Ardy who, who gave me a ring and asked me to meet the owners, uh, which I duly did. Um, uh, I went and spoke to them. Um, uh, and then a day, maybe two days later, they asked me to go back and speak to them again, uh, which I did. Uh, and was was offered the job, um, which was, which I was immensely proud uh, of taking. Um, certainly on the back of having a fantastic time there as a player. Um, it was a club that I still had an affinity with. Um, I'm I'm still living in the area, and uh, I I wanted to be successful there. And it was it was a dream job, you know. Even though. Um, Oldham has been on the decline for, for I don't know how long, um, and and uh, you know it's it was a happy place for me, and I wanted to uh, you know go back to those days. I, I wanted to to get people smiling again, and and and, and it was I knew it was going to be a tough job, um, but I, you know I had uh, certainly immense pride in taking it. What were those conversations like when you you first met the owners, and what were your impressions of them? Because they come across to many as slightly, I know, a bit of an enigma. No one's really quite sure. Yeah, they, they were charming at the time. Um, they, they said all the right things. They wanted to do things slowly. Um, his term was slowly, slowly. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, which I, I, I said at the you know at the same time, I said uh, this club needs stability. It, you know, the, whoever comes in needs time. Uh, which, you know, I understand can be taken away from you if, if results aren't great, but where Oldham were at the time, and, and I, I don't think, I think the majority of supporters get it. I think still some of the supporters go back to, you know, the Premier League and, and, and those days that we've spoken about so fondly, but ultimately, Oldham were in a bit of a predicament, like you, you just mentioned, they've just been relegated. They're in League Two. Finances aren't great. Attendances aren't great. It was probably as low as Oldham could go up until that date. And uh, it was a big ask, but we said we, we, we need to build foundations. This isn't going to happen overnight. And, and the club needs stability. Uh, we understand that the playing budget has to be reduced, which which we did. You know, we, we, we took over a million pounds off the budget for the owners. And uh, when we first went in, I think we had seven players. So obviously we couldn't shop at Harrods. You know, we were, we were shopping at Tesco and Woolworths, if you like. Um, no disrespect to, to, to the players that we bought in. Um, but that's that's where we were. And we, that's we kind cut... of the reality for a lot of teams, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. I mean, we cut our cloth accordingly. Uh, we bought in... Five loans who I thought were all terrific, you know, the likes of, uh, Iverson, uh, Surridge, Lang. We brought a young lad in who, who was 17 from Sheffield United, Sam Graham, who, who was just starting out on his journey. And, uh, a young lad, uh, Jordan Lydon, who, who had problems with, um, with injuries, who, who we thought was a good player again, but needed time. Alongside, you know, the senior players that we brought in, I thought we had a great mix. Um, and uh, you know that, that that's how, how we started. It was tough to get players in because everybody had heard about the financial situation at the club. You know, wages weren't going to be great, um, and those days were gone. Um, so we, we we tried to recruit accordingly. Now we hold our hands up and we say some of those signings didn't work out for us. But I don't think there's a manager at any football club that has had. 100% record with all of the signings, you know, and uh, I thought we were doing okay, and um, I was heartbroken uh, how, it, uh, how it ended. Well, tell, tell me a little bit more about the sort of, it seemed like you were doing very well. On the pitch, I think you only lost twice in the first 10 games of the season, and this is despite starting at a place like Forest Green. I remember the back line you had for that, that game. I think the oldest player in that defence was like 22 years old or something. Yeah, I mean, we, Forest Green was our second game, but you're right, you know, we, we started, uh, Iverson, Hunt, uh, Hamer, um, Edmondson, um, Graham, and, and 
the, the oldest player was 22. You know, uh, Clark, he got injured. Um, he was out for, you know, two, three, four weeks. And uh, the, the young boys, can you know, conducted themselves really well. So that back five, the eldest being 22, was, was very young. Um, but being from development football, I had no qualms in playing young players if I felt that was good enough. Um, and again, the squad was small. Uh, we suffered a few injuries. Um, but that, that's how it was, and, and, and that was how it was going to be. And uh, you, you, you can't make excuses. This is what we brought in. This is all we could bring in. You know, we, we felt we did as, as well as we could do with the finances that we had. And uh, we we thought we were okay. You know, we we threw a group of players together that needed time to gel. Um, and there was there was ups and downs along the way, which there always is with a, a new group of players. You know, there were times we were very good, there were times we were poor. Um, but there's one thing that all those players did, and that they worked their socks off every single game. They all looked like they were playing for you, in fairness. Yeah, I, I was in the away end at Maidstone in the Cup mm-hmm. on a slightly better plastic pitch than the one you probably played on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and you, you know, you never looked in danger. You put in a thoroughly professional performance. And, you know, even in the in the previous game on that was on television, you know, your players were really working hard for you in what was, you know, it's always difficult, the FA Cup games when you're playing yeah. a, a small yeah. team. We had three difficult games, you know, and, and the BT cameras were there for a reason. Um, they could smell an upset, um, but we we overcame that. You know, it was a difficult game, and, and uh, as you've mentioned, they can become difficult games. And uh, we we got Oldham through to the third round for the first time in six seven years, um, and the reward was uh, an away tie at Fulham. You know, so things were okay. We we thought we were fine. Um, you know, in terms of doing things slowly building foundations, getting through till January, being in and around the playoffs, which we were. And, uh, it, you, you know, I, I, like I mentioned before, I can't tell you how disappointed with how things ended. It was uh, it was a real upset. Yeah, it was a real real shock. I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes when you first arrived, the Jack Byrne disciplinary. Uh, I think uh, Anthony Gerrard as well uh, left the club in, under a bit of a cloud. I mean, how did this affect you? And, and how much were you aware of what was going on in these situations? Well, not not until you you get in the building and uh, decisions had obviously been made on on certain players before we got there, uh, which the owners were you know were, were not happy with, and and we adhered to that. You know, we we weren't um, uh, being told what to do and how to do it. We, what had happened had happened before we got there. So there were certain players had their run-ins with with the owners that we hadn't nothing to do with um, the players that we brought in were what we wanted um, there, were, there was obviously two or three or four other players that, that, that we could have brought in which we, we weren't allowed to due to finances but we were quite happy with what we brought in um, those issues that you spoke about were issues that, that, that were, were involved in the previous regime and uh, decisions had already been made on that so um we had to sort of roll with that a little bit and uh, and then, you know, try and move forward. Was there ever a case that the ownership were interfering with team selections, like the rumours suggested? No, they, they obviously had their ideas. Uh, we were quite strong. Um, we, we played, rightly or wrongly, the team that we wanted to play uh, uh, right until till the end. You know, there was speculation, but, you know, we had a... Uh, you know, uh, conversations with the owners, but we, we stuck to what, I, you know, we believed in. And I think that's why you could see the players responding in the manner that they did. Um, they, they'd run through a brick wall for us. You know, we, we had a, a great pre-season. We worked them hard. Uh, we, we were doing afternoon sessions, which was new to them. We, we, we did a lot of things off the field that people don't know about. Um, me and me and my staff were, were in at 7.30 in the morning which probably no one thinks about or say, so what? But I think we set a standard of, of how we wanted to conduct ourselves and how we thought the players should conduct themselves on the football pitch representing Oldham Athletic. And uh, I wanted to, to, to bring 
the players closer to the supporters, which I, I think we were doing. And I, I, I still, to, to this day, believe that that we're on the right right track. Uh, well, apart from looking at your results, and sorry to interrupt, but you, you actually had very good performances, apart from a sort of a middle blip where you had four defeats in five in around October time. Yeah. You know, it, and you were only eighth, I think, um, after that Carlisle defeat. Yeah, it was... That, that was difficult because uh, during that October period, uh, my assistant manager got sacked, Andy Rhodes, um, again, which was, was was out of the blue and difficult to deal with. And why, why, um, you, What was the reason behind that? Uh, I, I, I can't really go into that. Uh, it was something that I didn't want to happen and I, I, I didn't agree to. And, uh, you know, and I know Andy's... Uh, the same as me and that he's, he's really upset of how things ended for him um, I had to continue uh, couldn't bring anybody else in didn't didn't really want to work with anybody else I, I seeked advice from, from people that I knew in the game and they've said you have to stick at it um, which I did but that period you mentioned was, was when Andy left and the club was a little bit shaken um, you know I think we played at Steve Nuge we played at Northampton and we, we, we lost a couple of games and uh, we got it back on track, um, you know, up until till December and, and had some really good results and, and performances. Did you know that Andy was going to go in advance of him going, or like no. you say, when it came out of the blue? No, I, I came in from, we came in from training on a Friday going down to Northampton. So we were just getting on the bus and then we, we got asked to go to the office and uh, that, that's when it was done. So that, that was a tough time for me so early in my managerial career because Andy was a close friend and still is, you know, and obviously played for Oldham, had the same work ethic as myself, had the same desire to, to be successful for the football club that we both loved. And, and to, to this day we still speak um, of... You know how, how we wanted to do things properly at Oldham, and we thought we were we were doing okay. But you know that that was taken away from us. Yeah, indeed. Well, you 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 went on a run of games of I think it was six undefeated in the league before a narrow defeat at home to Exeter. Yeah. Um, I think this Exeter game there were reports that there was a problem in the dressing room afterwards. Is that true? Is there anything that happened there? Uh, again, I I can't go into fine detail. There, there was. There was words said in in my office uh, with the owners, and uh, um, it was um, it was it was difficult. And uh, it was unfortunately again, it, the Exeter game was a really good football contest, and uh, we got beat three two. A, a lad Stockley, who was at, trick, it? yeah Exeter at the time, was was a right hand for on the evening. Our centre half couldn't deal with him. And uh, unfortunately, we, you know, we got beat three two, but played well. And uh, their staff were very complimentary uh, after the game, which I suppose they can be. You know, uh, a pessimist would say, well, they can be. They've just won the game. But um, I, I think they were truthful in the comments. Uh, we thought we did okay. Uh, if we'd have won that, we'd have been maybe a point, two points off the playoffs. You know, and it, it was that close. And uh, we 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 we're always in and around the playoff uh, positions, um, you know, regardless of how people thought we played. But uh, yeah, there was there was things said in my office after that game that that, that weren't nice. Um, but I think a lot of people will find that football fans like me, right? You've just lost three two to a team that are, you know, a fair few steps ahead of where Oldham were in their sort of cycle. You you might say. You know, this is an Exeter side that um, have been right at the top of the league for quite some time. They're, yeah, Exeter were fourth when we played them. Yeah, good, good team. Yeah. And you lost by a single goal to a striker yeah. that's now in the championship. Yeah, yeah. You know, how can how can you, you you get too upset about that? I mean, as a football fan, yeah, I've seen my team get thumped, and you know when you you know when you can probably be disappointed because you're like, well, we didn't play well. But I actually, to prepare for this interview sat through the entire game of your 6-0 defeat at Carlisle and had a watch. And actually, although the scoreline, you'd probably be hugely disappointed by it, the performance was by no means a 6-0 performance. Yeah, it was it was unbelievable. And 
and again there was things that, that, that went on behind the scenes that weren't pleasant and uh, um, perhaps some of the players weren't in the right frame of mind for that game but like, like you said I, I couldn't believe it you know for once Iverson made a couple of mistakes um, who had been terrific up until then the goalkeeper um, but I, I look back at the stats I think Carlisle had seven shots we, we had about nine ten uh, Carlisle scored six we didn't score any we, we had more possession we had more free kicks we had more corners and if you you obviously didn't know the score you you, you know you, you quite wouldn't believe it but football being football they, these things happen you, you know and uh, well, you weren't the only manager to lose a game that season by that scoreline in that division no, nah, I think if you look back at my my record, my win percentage was thirty eight percent, and there are still managers managing now with with less than that. Um, or quite a few, I would imagine as well. Yeah. So, and and then I look back at you know some of the teams we beat during that that, that season who, who have now moved on this season. You know the likes of Crew, David Artel, who, who we we went to Crew and uh, you know outplayed them, beat them two 0 uh, he was very complimentary after the game, and and look where Crew are now. Uh, I mean, I, I even go back to to Richie Wellens, who who was you know the who held the seat before me, and he's gone and done well at Swindon. And I, I think people managers just need time. Certainly, at the, you know the lower end of of the football league for sure, um, because you have to get your principles across. You you're dealing with in, in the bargain basement. Um, you are going to get a few wrong. You, you know, you get a few right. You're dealing um, with a lot of young players as well. Yeah, and uh, and obviously, you know, the, the financial situation. And I'm not making excuses because I wouldn't because it, it was a job that I wanted. Um, well, you're doing very well at it, though. In, in fairness, yeah, yeah, and and I wanted to do well for not only for myself but for the football club and and, and for the people of Oldham. So what happened after the the Carlisle game? Were you were you given a call? Were you called into the office? How, how did you know this all end? Because it it just seems quite a shock to everyone, I think, at the time. Yeah, and and, and people say to me it was the six nil. It wasn't. It wasn't. And we were still in around the playoffs. We, we got the January window coming up. Um, um, and and again, you know, I feel uh, really really disappointed of that, of how it ended. Uh, I still feel. You know, we've got unfinished business there. You know, we we thought we were okay and we would do the things properly. We conducted ourselves really well around the football pitch, around the around the town, um, and um, I think we were getting the supporters back on side, and and, and the tendencies suggested that. You know, but uh, again, um, there was perhaps a minority of supporters that probably didn't feel that way, but. There always is, though, in fairness, yeah, Frankie, but, to but be o- fair. The Oldham are where they were. This is the lowest point for, for so many years. And uh, we had to, you know, start again. We, we, we had to strip it down, you know, re- readjust, set new new goals. And uh, I, I thought we were conducting ourselves really well through, throughout the six months that we were there. I think most people would quite agree. Um I know people that I talk to a lot about Oldham, uh, my podcast co-host, for example, we still go on about how it's probably like the worst decision that the owners have made it since they've been in charge. And they, I don't think the club have actually been higher than when you left since you left. No, I don't think they have. And uh, there's been a, several changes since I've gone. So um, the club does need stability. Um, that is the only way that, you know, uh, it, it will survive. Um uh, but, you know, that's in the hands of uh, other people. It is indeed. Do you hold much hope for them as it currently stands? I think it's difficult for them. Um, and like you said, you, you know, no one's no one's taken the club higher than, than when we were there. I know Pete Wilde came in and did a terrific job. Uh, you know, had the, had the beauty of the Fulham game, which which is, you know, where we got them with our team. Um I know Paul had his issues uh, in, in the month in seven games that he was there, uh, and obviously the, the the new manager that came in the summer, and obviously now you know. So it, it's, there's been four four different people in charge over 
within a year. It's, uh, it's beggar's belief. Um, and you played for a man who was there from 1982 to, what was it, 94? Yeah, and, I, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that Joe would have taken some, some beatings as well there, you know, but was given time um, uh, to, to get his um, philosophy across, uh, his, his, his way of playing, the type of people and players he wanted around the football club and uh, I, I feel sad when when I look back and I, I, I feel uh, frustrated uh, disappointed, angry all the emotions you can um, imagine uh, because it was it was a job that I dearly wanted that I dearly wanted to do well and I thought we were we were certainly along, along the right lines and again when I look back, at some of the man managers and clubs that we played while, whilst we were there who, who struggled but are now in the higher echelons of, of League Two, which we would have only got better. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree. I mean, you went to Tranmere who ended up getting promoted. Yes. Um, you know, you, you drew with them. You beat uh, Berry. You drew with Lincoln. Yeah. You beat Crew. Yeah. I, yeah. And, and I know um, words can be said. Mickey Mellon said to me, you're the best team that's been here. Um, and you were unlucky not to win today. We drew 1 1. And, uh, we, we were okay. We were doing things the right way. Yes, we, we perhaps weren't as consistent as, as we'd like to be, but the people that were, the teams that were consistent went off. Um, and, and, and that's football. Um, but we were striving to be consistent and I thought we were, were, were heading along the, the, the right lines. I absolutely agree with you. And I think, like, I say many people listening to this will probably be uh, staunchly in your corner in that respect. Uh, but moving on, what what's the future hold for Frankie Bunkers? What what are your plans for getting back into the game right now? Yeah, I'm, I'm still still looking. Um, it's it's perhaps something that uh, is most difficult, um, and people say you should enjoy your time if if you are released of your duties um, but I've, I've never found it uh, happy or good being out of work and uh, I'm, I'm looking to get back in as as soon as possible at somewhere um, you, you obviously apply for jobs um, and uh, you, you just perhaps one phone call a way of you know achieving that um, but it is tough certainly getting back in uh, once you're out of work um, I hope to be back in as, as soon as possible. I, I still think I've got something to offer. And uh, I thought, again, I, I, you know, I don't want to keep harping back. I thought we were okay. I thought we were doing a decent enough job to warrant another go somewhere else. And uh, hopefully that will that will come along. Well, let's hope so, because I think a lot of people would agree with that. Frankie, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you for this podcast today. And I just thank you so uh, so much for giving me your time to have a chat. Well, thank you, James. It was uh, much appreciated, and uh, thank you for giving me the uh, the opportunity. No problem. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast as much as I have conducting it. If you could give a retweet and a share for me, it'd be very much appreciated. Uh, we'll be back on Sunday, as always, for our regular podcast, looking back at all the action in League 1 and 2. Uh, but until then, take care, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye.